Hello and aloha everyone. Welcome to another interview for the Mantras for Peace gathering. I'm here today with very, very dear Davy Ward. And she is the director of the Institute for Authentic Tantra Education, among many other brilliant talents and projects. Um, Davy, would you like to just say hello and and please tell us what we're celebrating of your recent accomplishments so people get an idea of who you are? Yes, so thank you everyone. Thank you for inviting me to share here. I'm Davy Ward Erickson and I am the founder and director of the Institute of Authentic Tantra Education. And we are the first and only government accredited school for tantric sexual healing in the world. And so I'm very, very uh, proud, <laughs> uh, not in a toxic way, but in a like a enriching way of our accomplishment. Um, we went through a rigorous process of having our curriculum reviewed, having our institution policies reviewed uh, in order to become accredited with the Ministry of Ed Education here in British Columbia, Canada. And because our style of Tantra... Uh, yeah, it's huge. And because we really focus on applying uh, lineage-based tantric methods for the purpose of healing sexual trauma and correcting sexual dysfunction, as we know we live in a society that's very sex negative. And so the fact that we were able to get our curriculum approved by a government accrediting organization was pretty phenomenal. So, uh, so we're very, I'm, I'm delighted. <laughs> it's a testament to the efficacy of my tantra yoga practice. Yes, yes, yeah. and go Canada. Yeah, go Canada. <laughs> yes, that too, that helps. <laughs> that helps too. Uh, that, 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 the, two, the two married together is beautiful. Uh, wow. Well, um, I'm super happy to have you for this discussion today because, um, you know, as you know, my background is in the tantric philosophy and on my in my personal life I'm sex positive but I have not in my professional world um, brought those two together I kind of stick in my lane which is the tantric philosophy from a Kashmiri Shaivism point of view and um, the sound based practices as a tantric exploration between silence and sound um, and spirit and matter and on and on. But I think that the work that you're doing with sex mm -hmm. and sex therapy and sexual dysfunction is such an, just a critical gateway for our personal healing. So, um, I'm, I'm super happy to be able to talk to an expert in that field about generally like how to use our voice for peace and where does our sexuality fit into that? And what is, in, how do we take the tantric approach to healing our sexuality and channeling all of that primal power and energy into our service? Yeah. So I just, I, I think, I'd like to just let you talk about what you want to talk about. Um, and then if I have questions as we go along, or if I want to guide the conversation and other little nuances, I'll do that. But just put, give it to us. What do you well, think? I think I think this, it, it's it's a huge topic, particularly in the academic or philosophical understanding of tantra, because there is such controversy about you know neo tantra really focusing on sex and classical tantra. There isn't an emphasis on sex. And so, you know, my understanding of Tantra, and I'm not an academic and I don't consider myself like an es expert in theoretical or the philosophy of Tantra at all. My experience of Tantra has been very much about embodiment. And, you know, the orientation to Tantra as a 
path of healing, I believe, really depends on your teacher and your lineage of practice because not all Tantra uh, is directed towards healing. In fact, some styles of Tantra don't believe that there's anything to be healed. But because of who my teacher is, <laughs> that is and also my karma is, uh, that has been my orientation to Tantra yoga practice from the beginning. So my teacher is Lama Tashi Dundrup. He lives on Kauai. Uh, and he uh, is ordained in the Shenkpa Kagyu and Karma Kagyu lineages. So he is an ordained Lama. And I was introduced to the Tibetan five element sexual tantric practices. So as a uh, uh, these are lineage-based teachings that are instructions for us little humans in how to harness our sexual energy and use it and direct it to enrich and replenish and balance and heal the energy body. And then when the energy body is healed and enriched and balanced, then of course our physical reality is awesome, right? So energy in this tradition supersedes the physical so by cultivating sexual energy and directing it and utilizing it in this way, we're able to heal and repair on the level of the energy body. Um, and, and then the rest of our physical experience um, becomes more enlightened, becomes better. Um, so this particular lineage, the Shenkpa Kagyu lineage, this is really, really important in my view, is it was founded by women. It is one of the only remaining lineages of Tibetan Tantric Buddhism that was founded by women. It is also the only lineage that I am aware of that has instructions for working directly with the sex chakra. Most of the other traditions end the central channel at the navel. They erase the pelvis. <laughs> they erase the sex chakra. It doesn't exist. I know, interesting, and those are the patriarchal traditions. But this feminine tradition that was founded by Naguma and Sukha City has retained the instructions for how we as humans utilize our sexual pleasure. How do we cultivate that sexual pleasure and use it for the purpose for which it was designed? Also, in this tradition, it's understood that at the moment of orgasm, the moving pranas in the genitals, the downward voiding winds, brush the central channel. And every orgasm is literally a glimpse or a taste of enlightenment. So I think it's, it's a travesty of justice that we as human beings do not have instruction for how to make our orgasm, our glimpse of enlightenment, last for more than 10 seconds to be more than a genital sneeze. We are literally wired so that our sexual pleasure is the fastest, quickest access to our central channel. That's the way we're designed. Sexual pleasure gets us directly into the central channel. People can meditate for 10 years and not touch the central channel. And one orgasm brings you there in an instant. So the fact that these teachings have been erased from the texts and from the tantric tradition is a travesty in my point of view. And so with the blessing and permission of our Lama, we have been sanctioned to share these methods to directly address one of the core sufferings and woundings of our human species. And that is our disconnection and disassociation from our sexuality. And we can see that it's a source of wounding because one in four women has been sexually traumatized and one in six men has experienced some form of sexual trauma. And that is a huge number of people. So we can't walk around being enlightened, happy human beings when we're all traumatized. And much less than enlightenment, even just uh, functional, empathetic, non-stressed be a human non-violent like human. if our if yeah if if we experience if we have experienced um developmental trauma or sexual trauma which like you're saying the the numbers are outrageous um we are carrying that wiring for hyper vigilance and hyper reactivity um, that is the byproduct of our of our traumatic history. So, um, can you talk a little bit about about the healing, specific healing of trauma 
through pleasure? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll share a little bit about my initial journey. I mean, you know, some of the pieces as I continue to practice and evolve and learn like this weaving of how these Eastern methods like impact and, and the body and being able to translate into the Western language is, is still birthing in the process of birthing itself. Um, but my journey when I first started, so, you know, I came to Tantra not for the sex. So it was, it was, I was, I was a monk previously, as you know, and I was, I was deeply committed to my path of spiritual realization. And I was introduced to these Tibetan five element teachings as a way to, as I said, harness sexual energy and use it for the purpose of realization. I knew nothing about sexual healing at the time at all. It wasn't even, you know, on my radar. I had no frame of reference for it. And I did not know that there was anything to be healed, right? I was aware that I had sexual trauma, but I was completely ignorant of how that trauma was impacting me to this, to that present moment, right? So I was completely, yeah. I entered into this space with complete ignorance. And my experience mm -hmm. of weaving together these energy body yogas along with the somatic methods to cultivate pleasure, catalyzed this profound healing of all of this pain and cellular trauma and the dysregulation of my nervous system and all these, you know, all this whole like toxic soup. <laughs> that was me as a being. So you, so are you saying then that once you started with the practices that you became un, you were un, dis, unstabilized? Is that the right way? To, no, I was right previously, I became aware of how yeah. destabilized I was. Okay. So, so when, because sometimes when, when we start a practice, then you become all of a sudden aware of everything that was there. Exactly. Before the practice. That's exactly what occurred. And that in itself is destabilizing in your present moment. Like it's like, oh, whoa, I didn't know I had all that going on. Yeah. So yeah. both. True. Okay. So, so I became on. aware of how, but I was already yeah. so destabilized that this new thing was more like, wow, like this was the root cause of my destabilization. Like, wow, how awesome to become aware of it. But it was very much like, um, you know, yeah. peering more deeply into the hell realms that had always been ex had always been there mm. but i just wasn't uh, aware of the degree to which it was impacting my my current reality or my present reality at that time so so kind of like turning a light on into a messy room for the first time exactly and exactly having an eye opening experience about that yeah yeah, yeah. and and here's the the piece to what you were referring to the pleasure that I experienced, the bliss at those peaks of orgasm, which instead for my entire life, if I could ever have an orgasm, it was nothing more than a sneeze, right? But being able to refine and cultivate my ability to remain relaxed, aware, present, and mindful in the state of ecstasy facilitated and lubricated <laughs> the release of all of that trauma and wounding. It expressed itself mm. literally through my cells and the chemicals mm. that are generated in the body in these high states of pleasure facilitate the release of these wounds, facilitate the release of the trauma. And what they do in the brain is we're in this altered state of consciousness. So it allows the passing of these traumas without us attaching to them or grabbing to them or doing more than just noticing them because my consciousness was anchored in the state of ecstasy, this ecstatic bliss for like hours and hours and hours and hours. <laughs> right? And so all these wounds were arising in this container of bliss. So it was very easy to see them arise and allow them to pass through and purify because of the state, because of where my consciousness was resting in those moments. Mm, mm. It sounds it sounds to me like a very efficient and kind of fast track 
to recovery. Yeah. Well, that's what they say, that sexual tantra is the swift path to enlightenment. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's intense. You have to have some chops. You have to have some guts Mm -hmm. to face that degree of wounding and not lose yourself in it. And yet, as I said, the pleasure is the vehicle that allows that to occur. Um, And, Mm. yeah. The, the question that's arising for me is actually not necessarily what I was planning on talking to you about, but it feels important at this point because I'm imagining anybody listening to this is like, where do I sign up for that? You know, how do I get, how do I get started with that? And, you know, I would, I want, it makes me wonder about safety, mm-hmm. like choice. Is this a personal path that I do myself alone in my own body or is this something that I do with a partner and what are the guidelines or boundaries um, to kind of set up your practice environment for such an intense ride? Yeah, that is a wonderful question. So I can't speak to what other people are doing with their, with their practice or their teaching, but from our perspective, uh, healing begins here. This is, this is where we need, for those of us who are recovering from trauma, we need to feel safe in our own bodies. That's number one. And when we heal this nervous system, then we can bring that healing to another nervous system or in conjunction with another nervous system. So the way we teach is very strategic. And it's very layered and we are, we have an emphasis on being trauma informed. And so what that means is we understand the different styles of Tantra and their symptoms. We understand how they impact the nervous system and we understand the concept of titration, which means being able to, to dose or prescribe certain practices as medicine and then pull back if they're, if they're stimulating too much of an adverse reaction. And so with all of our instructions, we start with meditation. That is the foundation of practice. You cannot rest in orgasmic bliss if you cannot hold your focus. <laughs> like that's like it's useless, yeah. right? So the first thing that we teach are the mindfulness practices. Then we teach yogic breathing to help relax and regulate the nervous system. And then once you have a foundation of that, then we layer on top of that the sexual yoga practices. And we layer the sexual yoga first Mm -hmm. to somatic practices, so body-based practices for cultivating pleasure. And then once you've established a strong foundation with that or a solid foundation with that, then we layer on top of that the tantra yoga energy body practices, where you're actually moving and directing that sexual energy through the chakra system. So it's very deliberate, Mm -hmm. it's very slow, and each... In each instructional session layers upon the next. What is really important in our opinion for this type of journey is having a therapeutic relationship or a healing relationship with a guide or a coach. So a concept in Tibetan Tantra Buddhism is Sangha, is your spiritual community. So we do our utmost to provide a spiritual community with ourselves as the instructors and all of our students and graduates. And then in the container of our private coaching sessions, we work to establish a relationship that's based on integrity and trust and mutual respect. Mm, Yeah, beautiful. Well, I know you've been doing, not only have you been doing this for a long time, your teachers have been doing it for a long time. So I'm sure you've got all that dialed in pretty well. Um, But that, so if I were to summarize, I would say, okay, on one hand, it's the swift path, but starting on the swift path, you should start slowly. Slowly, gently. That's, I mean, that's what all the Rinpoche (laughs) say. Because these, at the core, these are Vajrayana teachings, right? So, like, you know, I mean, not all of the, like, if I teach you how to stroke a clitoris, that's not an instruction from the Vajrayana tradition, though there are texts that talk about how to stroke a clitoris, but... It's, they're kind of archaic. I'm going to stroke my clit the way I want to stroke my clit, right? So, but there are teachings, you know, in, in some of the texts about techniques to use, but they're pretty archaic and like, you know, I, I 
whatever. But as far as the five element teachings and the energy body yogas, these do come from the Vajrayana tradition. And so one of the instructions that the lamas all, always give is slowly, gently, because this is medicine. Like this is the orientation of Tantra from this lineage. Tantra is medicine. My teacher from the beginning has said Tantra is a holistic healing practice and it should include our sexuality because our sexuality is part of our humanity. You cannot be human and leave out your sex. <laughs> it's impossible. In fact, you would not be human without sex. So this concept that somehow we can disassociate or disengage from our sexuality and just push it to the side and, and, and you know, hide it in the closet is exactly why we have abuse and dysfunction and trauma mm. in the realm of our sexuality. Yeah. 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 When I, I, I hear, I hear some terms floating around that I want to bring in and I want, you know, you you talked about the the ton, this your your Tibetan lineage being founded by women, and for me everything you're talking about like I don't want to oh maybe it would be an, a mistake to overgeneralize that all of our problems are rooted in patriarchy, um, but you know definitely we can trace back trauma and terror in our women's bodies from that and we can trace back trauma and terror in bodies of color from the colonial byproduct of that of patriarchy um so there's a whole bunch of i mean we're, we're we are blessed at this moment that a lot of awareness and light is being shown on those the deep underpinnings of violence mm -hmm. in the world um and so what do, what what are you from the from the 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 goal of 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 creating a peaceful world how do we um how do we wake up to the violence of patriarchy, colonialism, misogyny, you know, and all of its crappy byproducts that, you know, the white fragility and spiritual bypassing and all the things that, you know, are, unco are unconscious defense mechanisms to uphold the status quo. How do we go from there into these realms mm -hmm. where we might hope for for peace and i know this is a deep uh, a favorite topic of yours so I, I wanted to give you a chance to get into that multifaceted right yeah multifaceted go wherever you want to go with it yeah. whatever inspires you i mean my core belief and again this you know it's always been my belief and i've seen it echoed in my in my llama my teachers healing starts here inside outside same and so you've known me for since 2005, right? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So yep. I probably show up a lot different now than I did back then. Yes and no. And I so mean, <laughs> yes, yes and no. I, I still, I see all the same um, uh, playful and, you know, powerful and fun aspects, but I have definitely um, been... Um, it's been a privilege to witness you coming into yourself yeah. over the the last fifteen years. Yes, and it's it's a delight. Yeah. So yes, yeah. yes, and no. <laughs> yeah. So 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 the core aspects of my personality like the the light and the bright and the fun they've just gotten bigger as the yeah. pain has yeah. dissolved as the trauma has repaired more of my light shines through more of my radiant essence mm -hmm. shines through. so i was just using myself an example because yeah. we have a personal history here yeah so so that yeah, is, yeah. that is the reality i mean that is the core of what we teach that that tantra is not about adding to or becoming something more it's about purifying obstructions we are Buddha. 
We are God. We are enlightened. That is what it is to be human. That is the human blueprint. We just have all these obscurations, all these filters that get in the way from us emanating as such. So Tantra is the yoga of purifying obscurations to allow the truth of your inherent nature to blossom and come forth. Inside, outside, same. As I purify, my world has changed tremendously. I came from being a stripper in Detroit 25 years ago to living in a million dollar house overlooking the lake, right? So, I mean, it's, it's as my internal trauma and obscurations have healed and purified, my external reality has reflected that exponentially. The root cause of what we see externally as far as the imbalance is a reflection of the poison and the toxicity of our own minds as a species. So when we heal it here, it will naturally heal there. And that doesn't negate the fact that, yes, there's things that we can do, actions we can take on the external and the external realm to antidote, but the true transformation heal and healing happens from the inside out. And so, mm. you know, all these issues are so, as we were saying, multifaceted. So the issue of, you know, patri the patriarchal traditions and all of that and the denial of women and the denial of sexuality. Well, I think we're seeing a rise uh, right now on the planet of, of, of yoni owners or vagina vulva owners raising their voices and saying, hey, no more. You know, we want to change this. And, you know... I, I see so many, I also see this uh, because I have the privilege of working with um, beautiful humans of all gender expressions. I see an equal uh, desire in, in men, uh, not all men, but an equal, there is an equal desire in many, 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 many men who I have the privilege to connect with, who are seeking balance, who recognize that the toxic expression of what it is to be a man is debilitating, is harmful, and they want no part of that. And they mm. desire to actively work to dismantle these systems of patriarchy as they arise within themselves. So, you know, again, speaking to your question, I think one of the, the, the key points is recognizing that we have been colonized. We have been, you know, patriarchalized or whatever here. Our entire yeah. society, in, at least in North America, is rooted in racism. It's rooted in patriarchy. It's rooted in sexism. It's rooted in all of these toxic structures. And it is not a personal failing that we're racist sometimes. I'm racist sometimes. And I'm like, oh, fuck, that's embarrassing. I've been racist towards myself most of my life, right? So, like, you know, that's our conditioning. And our conditioning is not our fault, but it is our responsibility to address and to antidote. Mm -hmm. So, you know, where I feel pain is when I see white people particularly wanting to bypass issues of racism, like, oh, we're all one, and by talking about it, you're making it real. I'm like, well, I live in a body that carries 400 years of trauma, right? And, and I specialize in trauma, so I know that my DNA has been devastated by this for centuries and that some of the struggle that I've had in this lifetime has been a result of what happened to my great great grandma that was never healed or purified or transformed so it's really easy when you live in a body that's had minimal trauma to say oh you should just get over it but a you yeah. can't get over something that's still happening if I'm consistently being raped every day I don't get to get over that <laughs> you know and B, when you're talking about historical genetic traumas, they are impacting us on a level that has yet to be recognized by society. So where I yeah. feel pain is when people are unwilling to examine themselves for how they are willing to uphold these structures of colonialism and racism and sexism and all the isms without being willing to examine themselves. And perhaps it's because of, you know, feeling embarrassed or, you know, I don't, it, it, who wants to acknowledge, oh yeah, wow, what I said was really sexist. Like I had an experience with a, with a non-binary student and she was just like, the way you're communicating right now is really not meeting my needs for inclusion. And that's mm. sad and disappointing to, to hear that message 
when you're trying to be a good person, but it also doesn't mean that I'm not being a good person. It means, wow, okay, I still have room to grow. Wow, I still yeah. have room to learn, right? It's, it's, it's yeah. I'm not done yet. I can still do better, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's what's required of us. Those of us who are warriors and spiritual teachers and guides like like being willing to hear to to allow that we have blind spots being willing to to allow that yeah we can we can be more inclusive there are things there are there are awarenesses that we can there are, are aspects of ourselves that we can become aware of so that we can be more inclusive if that is actually our goal so that's the question you know when we talk about yeah. inclusivity do we really want to do what it takes to have that or are we more comfortable with the status quo just be honest with yourself yeah. <laughs> and and we're also seeing in our great, you know, the greater political landscape of, you know, the United States and many other countries right now where there are people who are willing to come out and say, no, I don't want inclusion. Mm -hmm. I want, I want to keep, uh, white privilege is great. I want to keep it. You know, everybody should have their own country and black people can go over here. I mean, I just saw this tour, this shockingly clear video about somebody on the, the alt-right, like the person who came up with the alt-right uh, keyword, you know, idea. And I was like, wow, okay, you know, thank you for your clarity. Like, it, I don't, I don't want to, it, it, it really forced me to, to observe that my assumption that everybody wants equality and that inclusion and equality and justice and, you know, like a, a kind of, you know, I guess utopian togetherness is a shared ideal because that's, that's, that's my interest. Um, but to, to, to put it right out there that, yeah, not everybody wants that. Um, and I, I, I respect that. And like the error that I see with that is like, well, then go back to Europe because this is not your country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or where, I mean, but where would they go? Where would you go back to anyway? Like, cause Europe was there, you know, there were indigenous people in, you know, I respect yeah. that you go back to wherever, but I'm like, you go back to like the assumption that the United States belongs to white people is part of the core structure of racism in America. It does not belong to white people. <laughs> exactly. No, 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 no. I think we missed a little part of the history there. If that's your assumption. Um, yeah. So to, to, to bring it back to the, to bring it back to how this applies to the tantric approach. And I will speak from the tantric approach as I observe it in my relation to sound mm -hmm. and vibration and my, my personal approach to um, allowing what is and what vulnerability and what power is there in the, in the dance with with um as vibration moves through me um and you'll sp speak to it in in your review with um specifically with the application in the sexual realm um as well but like for me what you mentioned about spiritual bypassing like when you see white people saying get over it can't we aren't we all just one um it's really difficult or nearly impossible to have a practice, to have an embodied practice and maintain that out of spiritual bypassing. Mm -hmm. So for me, like the tantric approach is like the pin that just like keeps you anchored in having to face whatever else you didn't know is going on in there mm -hmm. um so do you have any i mean that that's a piece i wanted to add in the conversation do you have anything to add or um sh shape more into that keyword embodied practice 
Yeah. Right? So there's a lot of folks that practice without being embodied because maybe they start to bring their practice into the body and they hit a wound or a trauma block and they want to shoot out. In fact, oh yeah, in developmental trauma. So you're familiar with developmental trauma. Yes, one of, so there's, so in, for those of you that don't know, so developmental trauma, love this book. It's called Healing Developmental Trauma. Um, Lawrence Keller or something like that. I can't remember. I always forget the authors, but healing developmental trauma changed my life. So there's five biologically based needs that are wired into the human design connection, attunement, trust, autonomy, and love sexuality. Can you say that one more time? Connection? Uh -huh. connection is number one. So connection is in the womb. So from zero to like six months, six months to a year. Then there's attunement. Then there's trust. Okay. Then there's autonomy. And then there's love sexuality. Right. And they have mm -hmm. in this book, they describe like the different stages of de brain development and mm -hmm. how at each of these different stages, like if there's interruptions in any of these biologically based needs, that it causes brain damage. <laughs> Essentially, it causes yeah. it causes, you know, trauma to the to the development of the brain. Yeah. Connection based trauma is the most prevalent. And mm -hmm. there's two coping personalities that stand out for connection-based trauma. One is the intellectual bypasser. Second mm -hmm. is the spiritual bypasser. Oh, they, ah! they categorized it as intellectual and spiritual bypassers. And sometimes you get a little bit of both, right? Exactly. <laughs> So they call them intellectual types or the yeah. spiritual types. And they are people whose needs, their wound around human connection was so severe that it causes them to live in, their, in the etheric realms or in their minds. And they avoid embodiment at all mm. costs. Mm. Yeah. Because it's yeah. terrifying to be in a body. Yeah. So my husband yeah, was a yeah. perfect example of this, intellectual, PAD, PhD, academic, lived in his head all the time. And when we first met, he would literally walk into my house and start crying. And he's like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> but he would after my energy and he would just start crying and releasing all of this emotional pain that he was carrying around that was preventing him from actually being in his body. And it's been this beautiful process through God. We've been together since seven years now. It's been this beautiful process over these seven years of peeling away these layers so that he could feel safe inhabiting his body from root mm. to crown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Do you keep a stash of Kleenex by the door in just in case? Well, it's <laughs> funny. I, he, <laughs> I used to. I used to. But as he's become more embodied, now he breaks me. We have a little joke that with our tantric sex, oh. I used to break him. Now he breaks me. <laughs> uh, sounds like a good deal. Oh, <clears throat> wow. Yeah. And I think, um, I know for, for me in my journey of self-development and, and awareness um the i probably if i categorize myself i'd have a little bit of both but i think i i sought spirituality as a as a as a strategy for connection and i and i feel um it the connection with the infinite through sound primarily um, meets my need for, it meets my need for connection. Mm -hmm. And, and, or, but I can't allow myself to bypass because my approach is, is tantric in nature. So that means like, I, I go through the same um, kind of, vulnerability thresholds and discomfort uh in the the attachment process mm -hmm. there with with my sound-based practice as i do in 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 relationships mm -hmm. you know so the developmental trauma that i experienced um 
as a little girl, like is like he, he, in a continuous, mm-hmm. you know, movement of, of playing itself out and healing mm-hmm. um, through awareness mm-hmm. there. And, and I think that, I think it's really an important point that the spiritual path can either be a bypass where you just, you know, go up and out and leave your body and leave your needs. Like it, we, we both have a background in nonviolent communication. We, we, we deny our humanity and deny our needs and kind of reach for some idealized guru or some, mm-hmm. you know, transcendent ideal mm-hmm. or we or the spiritual path has an is is embodied and going down and in as equally as it's going up and out and, yeah um, and my experience of, of tantra at least in this lineage is it is an in you're working directly in the central channel and then out and there's no up my mm-hmm. llama's like don't go up <laughs> you're gonna go to the god realm don't yeah. go up Go go out, yeah. <laughs> become space. Yeah, be all encompassing. Mm-hmm. And and yes, yeah, yeah. sorry to cut you off there, but you know, I I I would my spiritual path before tantra, I was trying to bypass. <laughs> I, wanted, yep. I wanted to die. I tried to kill myself a few times, and I was like, forget this. If I have to be in a body, I want to like be transcending it. I want to get up and out. So that was my goal of my mm-hmm. spiritual practice. And yep. it was the Hindu path. It was an up and out path. When I encountered Tantra, yep. Tibetan Tantra, it was all about a deep dive mm-hmm. in, literally, to the level of your DNA. <laughs> right? And that's why yeah. it was so intense. Yeah. But, but that, that, to me, is, is, is the path of Tantra yoga. It is the path of embodiment because the body is Buddha. All wisdom, knowledge, and power are inherent in the human form. Enlightenment doesn't happen in the spirit realm. Enlightenment happens in this form, in this body. Yeah. And that's also the, the feminine path, too. I think that's yeah. very, very interesting. Yeah. A lot of, you know, the, the traditions that teach the up and out are rooted in patriarchy. Traditions that are more matriarchal or feminine-based teach that embrace our humanity, embrace the body and the physical realm, as opposed to viewing the body and the physical realm as something to disavow or transcend. It's about embracing it fully. We're going to be out of these bodies soon enough. <laughs> And then we'll be looking for another one. So while I'm here, <laughs> why not do the work? While I'm here, let do the work and let me enjoy it to its maximum capacity. You know, well, let's, let pleasure. me use my senses. Yes, yes. And so, just to kind of wrap that 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 part up, because I think it's so like. For those people who are reading, uh, listening to this, who are not as familiar with these concepts of racism and patriarchy and decolonization and misogyny, like they're all tied together, in in my view, anyway. And the the tantric path of living in your body and being like being right here right now and not trying to you know use your spiritual path like numbing heroin to get you high and out like you know oh, I could I could go on about that but that 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 is it's definitely not an easy journey but it's a necessary one I think that we need to be willing to go on if we want to inhabit a truly peaceful, nonviolent, embracing, life embracing and life celebrating world. So. Yeah, if you really want to evolve, you ha- it happens in your body. <laughs> and that's where evolution occurs in your form. So, so absolutely. Yeah. And, and I mean, how is it compassionate to deny, to, to, to deny, to disrespect, to ignore, to try to suppress other people's suffering? That's not a path of compassion. 
if your spiritual practice is about you transcending, but it leaves out everybody else, you know, have fun floating in the ethers, but it, it's not, it's not actually inclusive and it actually is not cultivating union. Right. And that's the goal. I mean, that's no, what enlightenment it's cultivating is. Cultivating isolation. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So back to the first need is connection. If your if your path is cultivating isolation, yeah. you're traumatized. You have trauma. Yeah. 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 And you and yeah. you need some care. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And I love I love how you put it that like it's not a personal failing. No. When you discover that you have been traumatized and that you have been colonized <sighs> and that you're operating from a operating system that has violence coded mm -hmm. as its core structure. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a personal failing. No, it's welcome to what planet is, Earth. What did you say? It's, a, it's not a personal failing, but it is your responsibility. It is our personal responsibility. Yeah, too, because we, if, we, if we are ignorant of those, then we are perpetuating those structures. If we're ignorant of where they live and reside within ourselves, then we are perpetuating violence and, and trauma on, on other people. And that is bad juju. That's bad karma. <laughs> I did lots of that when I was ignorant. But now that I've had the privilege and the opportunity to heal and become more aware, it's a, a celebration when I have those structures pointed out to me, whether it's myself being like, ooh, Davy, look at that, or somebody else saying, ooh, Davy, look at that. Mm. It's, a, it's cause to rejoice because I'm becoming aware of where I'm instilling pain and where I can be more, more human, mm. where I can be yeah. more loving and compassionate and kind, which actually is the human blueprint. Love, connection, kindness, compassion, is the core blueprint for what it is to be human. That is our core blueprint. Mm. Anything other than that is trauma. Mm. That's a that's a beautiful key statement to 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 keep pulsing out. Like to to remember that yeah. is um, a guiding light. I think for you know, oh, here we are, it's the end of July, 2020. Shit's hitting the fan in every possible direction. <laughs> and we're going to air this. Uh, we're going to air this in the midst of a pandemic and important elections and, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement in full there there is a lot going on and who knows what's going to be going on by the time it this goes live and you know continues to be aired but like to have we do have a, a, a we do have an option of where we want to focus yeah. and um and i guess that's that's what that's what this project is about with mentors for peace is exactly yeah. exactly Be yeah and that talk about these yeah, things and then leave something, something. Yeah. yeah and then that core understanding that the human blueprint of love that's not something i made up that's what the trauma experts i follow and study they say a non-traumatized brain is wired for love that's the mm -hmm. truth <laughs> That is the biological mm. truth of what it is to be human. We are wired mm. for love. So all of what we see going on is a cry for love. Yeah. It's a scream for love. Yeah. And we can practice love by offering empathy to those people of color, those women, those people who have been harmed and to whom violence has been perpetuated against for centuries. We can, we can offer love in the form of empathy and the willingness to hear your pain. Wow, I hear. Wow. What must that be like to live in a body that has that experience? 
that must be agonizing. How dehumanizing. So if you as a white person can offer empathy, authentic empathy, you are offering love. And that is what we're screaming about. <laughs> I feel like I could go, we could go on and on. I have so many more things I'd like to ask you. Um, I know we're getting towards the end of your time, but on that note, um, I wonder if you would speak a little bit about um, finding your voice and feeling safe, either safe enough or angry enough or empowered enough to say what you need to say, even when people have been trying to discredit you mm -hmm. um, or silence your voice. Mm -hmm. could, could you speak because we our community is all about voice and mantra and sound and you know yeah using your voice as an instrument for peace so I'd love to hear kind of what that has been like for you and do you have any tips yeah. or wisdom to share on that well for me it really started with with reintegrating my sexuality into my human humanity <laughs> my awareness as a human being it's like oh my sex isn't just this shameful dark shadow over here it was reclaiming and understanding and cultivating my sexuality my sexual pleasure specifically as a force for healing as a force for transformation and literally repairing my nervous system and my brain through tantric sexual yoga practices and I would say the foundation of like the sexuality is an essential component. The foundation of my practice is my non-sexual Tantra. So my deity yoga practice, like I'm a pretty, I would say hardcore Vajrayana practice in that, not with all the trappings and all that, but just that we actually practice. <laughs> we sit down, we pump out our mantra, we do our visualization and I love it. And so I'm regularly every day transforming my physical body into a light body and emanating mm. as a deity of compassion and power. Mm. And so it is my non-sexual Tantra yoga practice that heals and repairs those obstacles to my showing up in the world with my full capacity and my full potential. And it happens layer by layer by layer by layer right? We're onions, <laughs> so to speak, or roses that are, lotuses that are blossoming is what we are. Um, but it is, it is, it is my Tantra practice. That is both the, primarily the non-sexual with the incorporation and the integration of the sexuality because because i'm no longer separate right when we're when we're disassociated and disconnected from our sexuality or we have shame and guilt and fear there's this huge aspect of our spirit of our consciousness of our experience as humans that's separate that's disassociated so our functioning is like from the waist up that's not that's not a whole human being and there's so much shadow there and under, like every demon has the potential to be an angel. Every demon has the potential to be an ally. So as I've transformed and healed the demons of my sexuality, they have become powerful allies. So now I don't have all this stuff latent in the shadows that's fucking up my, my, my grill here, you know, fucking up my game, so to speak, because I'm integrated and I'm whole. So when I see some of these teachers who have tried to shut me down and shame me for being a powerful woman who speaks about sex and Tantra in the same breath, the audacity of that, I look at them and I see sexually disintegrated humans. I see people who have wounding and shadow and fear and shame around their sexuality and they are disintegrated. And so I really say to you looking for a teacher, is your teacher whole? Are they integrated from the root to the crown? Because if they're not, if they're only integrated from the navel to the crown, there's a whole glacier of shit under the surface that is going to come up <laughs> at some point. It can, can only hide for so it long. It can sink the Titanic. It will sink the Titanic. It will it's sink a matter Titanic. of time. It is just a matter of time. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And so you see that well, with all the guru abuse and all the, you know, get one, they fall like dominoes. They do. And the pattern is so obvious. Denial, denial, denial. Oh, look, I mean, what you suppress, 
what you repress becomes perverted and distorted. Yeah. 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 So for you in finding your voice with like, with all of this, um, I just want to acknowledge the badass courage that that has taken for you and really celebrate that um, you have been willing to say what you need to say and do what you need to do regardless of the pushback that you have gotten and currently get, and maybe will hopefully less get in the future, but nonetheless, you still, you're still, you're on your mission. And I have so much um, just amazing respect and appreciation for that. Thank you for doing what you do. Thank you. And and I just want to say what motivates me is because I'm on the ground in the trenches with people who are suffering. So I don't have the privilege of floating along and being like, oh, this intellectual esoteric concept. I have my hands in blood, you know, energetic, emotional blood. Mm -hmm. I'm holding space for people who have been raped from the time they were three years old until they were 12. And I'm giving them methods to actually feel safe in their bodies for the first time. So you can say what you want, but I'm actually in the ER with these people, helping them repair the damage that has been done by your ancestors. (laughs) <laughs> because most of these people coming at me are white men. So I'm actually repairing the bodies and the nervous systems of people of color from the damage that has been done by their ancestors and continues to be per- perpetuated upon them in this society. So I'm not motivated because, you know, it, you know, like I'm so great. I'm motivated because these people need medicine and it is my job to bring yeah. them the tools that they need to heal. So delightful, Madam Davy. I'm so pleased. Thank you so very much for this. Thank you. Thank you for the Love opportunity you. to share. Yes. Yeah. Love you. Love you all. Blessings. Omani <laughs> Pemihon.